Here's an extensive detail of the abuse of black male slaves by white women. According to a certain historian, few scholars have viewed the relationships of enslaved men and free white women through the lens of sexual abuse in part because of gendered assumptions about sexual power. This is in keeping with both the standard feminist conceptualization of rape as a tool of patriarchal oppression, as well as the traditional unfeminist notion of women as too weak emotionally and physically to commit serious crimes, let alone sexual abuse, and the idea that men cannot be raped. However, it is becoming increasingly clear that women, too, are capable of committing horrid sexual offenses and using sex as a means of domination and control. You are welcome to this video. Don't forget to hit the like button right in front of you, share with friends to spread our black narrative, and then subscribe to stay with the family. As light-skinned enslaved women who were the product of mixed-race couplings were particularly vulnerable to sexual predation, so were light-skinned male slaves finding themselves a great deal the particular target of such sexual exploitation. Apparently, they may have attracted their enslavers more, who in most cases were swooned by the mere sight of them and would exert racial supremacist authority over exercising them as their sex property. As Thomas Buckley found in his analysis of divorce in antebellum Virginia, Roughly 9% of Virginia's divorce petitions from 1786 to 1851 were for interracial adultery, with 23 of those petitions coming from white men who complained about their wives' relationships with black men. Peter Nielsen, traveling in Virginia in the 1820s, recorded that he had learned about a planter's daughter having fallen in love with one of her father's slaves. She had actually seduced him. In her 1861 autobiography, Harriet Jacobs told the chilling story of a male slave named Luke who was kept chained at his bedridden master's bedside so that he would be constantly available to tend to his physical needs, which included sexual favors. In veiled language so as not to offend the sensibilities of 19th century polite society, Jacobs reported that most days Luke was only allowed to wear a shirt so that he could be easily flogged if he committed an infraction such as resisting his master's sexual advances. In a 2011 Journal of the History of Sexuality article, the scholar Thomas Foster contended that enslaved black men regularly were sexually exploited by both white men and white women, which took a variety of forms, including outright physical penetrative assault, forced reproduction, sexual coercion and manipulation, and psychic abuse. In one example provided by Foster, a man named Louis Bourne filed for divorce in 1824 due to his wife's longtime sexual liaison and continued pursuit of a male slave named Edmund from their community. Foster contended that such pursuits could enable white women to enact radical fantasies of domination over white men, while at the same time subjecting the black enslaved male to her control. Foster also contended that such pursuits were not uncommon, as demonstrated by testimonies from the American Freedmen's Inquiry Commission, established by the Secretary of War in 1863, which took depositions from abolitionists and slaves regarding the realities of slave life. Such depositions included stories of sexual liaisons between enslaved men and their mistresses. Indeed, there is considerable documentation of white women forcing black men into having sex. Captain Richard J. Hinton, an abolitionist commander in the Civil War, stated, I have never found a bright-looking colored man whose confidences I have won, who has not told me of instances where he has been compelled, either by his mistress or by white women of the same class to have connection with them. One former slave told Hinton that his mistress ordered him to sleep with her after her husband died. Foster further concurs with scholars who argue that rape can serve as a metaphor for both enslaved women and men as the vulnerability of all enslaved black persons to nearly every conceivable violation produced a collective rape subjectivity. Most Americans know that George Washington owned enslaved people at his Mount Vernon home, but fewer probably know that it was his wife, Martha, who dramatically increased the enslaved population there. When they wed in 1759, George may have owned around 18 people. Martha, one of the richest women in Virginia, owned 84. The high number of people Martha Washington owned is unusual, but the fact that she owned them is not. Stephanie E. Jones Rogers, a history professor at the University of California, Berkeley, is compiling data on just how many white women owned slaves in the U.S. 
and in the parts of the 1850 and 1860 census data she has studied so far, white women make up about 40% of all slave owners. Slaveholding parents typically gave their daughters more enslaved people than land, says Jones Rogers, whose book, They Were Her Property, White Women as Slave Owners in the American South, came out in February 2019. What this means is that their very identities as white Southern women are tied to the actual or the possible ownership of other people. White women were active and violent participants in the slave market. They bought, sold, managed, and sought the return of enslaved people in whom they had a vested economic interest. Owning a large number of enslaved people made a woman a better marriage prospect. Yes, you heard correctly. Once married, white women fought in courts to preserve their legal ownership over enslaved people as opposed to their husband's ownership, and often won. For them, slavery was their freedom, Jones Rogers observes in her book. Previous scholars have argued that most Southern white women did not buy, sell, or inflict violence on enslaved people because this was considered improper for them. But Jones Rogers discovers that white women were actually trained to participate from a very young age. Their exposure to the slave market is not something that begins in adulthood. It begins in their homes when they are little girls, sometimes infants, when they are given enslaved people as gifts, she says. Citing interviews with formerly enslaved people that the Works Progress Administration, a New Deal agency, conducted in the 1930s, Jones Rogers shows that part of white children's training in plantation management involved beating enslaved people. It did not matter whether the child was large or small, one woman told the WPA, they always beat you till the blood ran down. As adults, white women often tore black women away from their babies so they could nurse the white mistress's baby instead. To this end, white women placed thousands of advertisements in newspapers looking for enslaved wet nurses to feed their own children and created a huge market for enslaved black women who had recently given birth. Why did these white women want black women to nurse their children? One complained she felt like continuously having children and continuously nursing her children made her a slave to her children. That's an actual quote, Jones Rogers says. Some white mothers, such as Jane Pettigrew, cited convenience. She had a distaste for breastfeeding her own infants because it made her a slave to her children. Some black women reported in WPA, Works Progress Administration, interviews that their mothers would always give birth around the same time as the white mistress, suggesting that these mistresses were also orchestrating the sexual assault of enslaved women. Rogers continues, There were instances in which formerly enslaved people did in fact say that their mistresses either sanctioned acts of sexual violence against them that were perpetrated at the hands of white men, or that they orchestrated instances of sexual violence between two enslaved people that they owned in hopes of producing children from those acts of sexual violence. White women also fought to maintain the wealth and free labor that slavery provided them through the Civil War. The Civil War was America's bloodiest and most divisive conflict, pitting the Union Army against the Confederate States of America. The war resulted in the deaths of more than 620,000 people, with millions more injured in the South left in ruins. As Union troops made their way through the South freeing enslaved people, white women would move enslaved people farther from the soldiers' path. One woman, Martha Gibbs, even took enslaved people to Texas and forced them to work for her at gunpoint until 1866, a year after slavery's formal abolition. After the Civil War, Southern white women sought to recreate slavery through exploitative work contracts. Some even wrote books portraying the institution of slavery as gentle and benign, the most famous being Gone with the Wind by Margaret Mitchell, a woman born 35 years after abolition. Yet as Jones Rogers argues in her book, it was not only white women's ideological and sentimental connections to slavery that made them defend it. Scarlett O'Hara would have been protecting her economic interests too, she says. Scarlett O'Hara is a fictional character and the protagonist of the novel Gone with the Wind, written by Margaret Mitchell. The novel was published in 1936 and was set during the American Civil War and Reconstruction era. While sexual labor was very much a part of British and American slavery, instances of sexual abuse in women's slave narratives were encoded in the language within women's slave narratives. When Harriet Jacobs wrote, O oh, virtuous reader, you never knew what it means to be a slave, in her incidents in the life of a slave girl, calling to her audience even as she challenged their position of privilege, 
to describe the prevalence of sexual abuse within the institution of slavery. Jacobs not only broke convention, pushing the boundaries of the slave narrative genre, but also shattered the silences surrounding instances of sexual abuse and slavery. Silence, narratives, and resistance sheds light on how the stories of black male slaves who suffered abuse at the hands of white women were systematically suppressed and hidden from mainstream historical accounts. This suppression was driven by the desire to maintain a carefully constructed image of white femininity and the broader narrative of slavery that focused predominantly on white male slaveholders and their actions. For this reason, the voices of enslaved individuals, especially black male slaves, were often disregarded or dismissed in historical documentation. Slave narratives and accounts that depicted white women as perpetrators of abuse were seen as a threat to the prevailing social order. Publishing such narratives could challenge the prevailing perception of white womanhood and undermine the image of the virtuous and refined Southern lady. Enslaved individuals faced severe consequences for speaking out or revealing the harsh realities of their lives under slavery. To protect themselves and their loved ones, many slaves hesitated to openly disclose the abuse they endured, especially if it involved white women. However, despite the efforts to silence these narratives, some instances of resistance and resilience have been preserved in historical records and slave narratives. The abuse of black male slaves by white women represents a distressing and overlooked aspect of slavery's dark history. By exploring the power dynamics, sexual exploitation, and physical and psychological abuse endured by black male slaves, we shed light on the complex interactions between race, gender, and power during this era. Acknowledging and understanding this painful history is an essential step towards a more inclusive and just society where the voices and experiences of all victims of historical oppression are recognized and remembered. This brings us to the end of this video, and I hope you enjoyed every bit of it. Don't forget to encourage us by hitting the like button in front of you, sharing to as many as you can, and subscribing to stay with the family. Thanks for watching. See you again soon.